we will upload it later. So. It's a recording. So hello, hello, greetings everyone. Welcome to the presentation of Carbon Market Exchange. It's, uh, we are here at the Digital Innovation Pavilion, uh, organized by the International Association for the Advancement of Innovative Approaches to Global Challenges and the Climate Change Coalition. And uh, we are very happy and proud to have Carbon Market Exchange as our partner and the support uh, in this endeavor. Uh, we are here uh, to create a space and opportunity for digital solution providers to come to present their solutions. Uh, there are so many areas in which uh, digital innovation, especially blockchain technology, can help to the fight against the climate crisis and carbon market exchange has several role of these tools and especially today as we have the COP27 finance day we are delighted to have you here and uh, we would uh, like to hear from you Gina Foster and uh, Ralph uh, William uh, Michael and um, Rose uh, is about. So Gina, please uh, take the floor. Good morning. I, I would just like to say thank you for your attendance and uh, being here with us today. So we are Carbon Market Exchange. I am the CEO of Carbon Market Exchange and we're here today to talk to you about climate finance. Money really does grow on the truth. originator and creator of nature-based offset credits in the world. We go into various countries around the world. We're in Africa, Central and South America, and Asia at the moment, and we're growing rapidly. What we do is we, we go in and we establish nature-based uh, environmental conservation projects, and we fund them through the sale of carbon credits. Okay. We can do we can achieve the goals that the UN has established for climate mitigation without involving uh, government resources or local resources. We have markets available to us to be able to fund these projects over the long term. Uh, so the way it works is we go into a, a region, we acquire carbon rights, we protect in most of our projects or deport our deforestation, and also uh, uh, agroforestry. So we'll go into a location, we'll establish what we're trying to preserve. We also do blue carbon and preserve coral reefs. Uh, the major reason for that, as we all know, is most of the oxygen on this planet comes from coral. Uh, the problem that we run into is the fact that the Great Barrier Reef off of Australia is dead. We just haven't had a funeral at the moment. Okay, 50% of the coral on the Great Barrier Reef has died in the last three years. Coral provides over half of the oxygen, between half and two thirds of the oxygen on this planet. So as the coral dies, so does our species, and so does life as we know it on this planet. So we try to preserve that. Deforestation becomes an important part of that because if you cut down all the trees, that carbon goes into the oceans and acidifies the oceans killing coral. Okay, so we try to preserve those things and then what happens is we'll get the rights to it and we finance it by selling carbon offsets. That money goes back to the local communities and it funds whatever they need to fund and we preserve the natural environment as we know it. Uh, the market for carbon markets has grown exponentially and is now very, very uh, alive and well. Uh, the cap and trade systems with allowances are all sort of tapped out at the moment and are failing. That's why they're integrating today carbon offsets in the allowance market. Those two markets have to merge, and they will over time. Governments have to realize that those systems are not working. 
okay, and carbon offsets has a direct impact on the environment, whereas allowances is an arbitrary system that supports existing companies and existing technologies and allows them uh, to pollute. You know, people claim it's a pay to play the offset market, it is not. The carbon offset market has direct environmental impact. The allowance market does not. That money goes into the great coffers of the government and may or may not get to anything related to the environment. Okay, so a carbon tax is passed on to the people who can least afford it. The next size tax is sin tax. It goes right to the middle class and lower middle class and it's a regressive tax system that does not work because the money goes into the government coffers and does not produce results. The U.S. has been regulating the environment since 1899. What does it achieve? Virtually nothing. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Ralph, for that introduction. So uh, Ralph was a partner at Bear Stearns. He's also a corporate attorney. So we'd like some of your information. How do you see Wall Street and the gang joining into the carbon markets how are they participating, and how do you foresee this happening in the future? All the Wall Street banks have made large commitments to the carbon markets. Right now, Wall Street has pledged well over a trillion dollars uh, to develop the carbon markets. Okay? They view this as an important vehicle to preserve the environment, and also, at the moment, uh, not only is there money going into it, but there are other resources that they're providing. Uh, the Wall Street banks all have very strong government ties and also very strong uh, allies around the world. So they are using their power right now to uh, create and build the carbon markets, specifically the offset market. They call it the voluntary market, but it's not so voluntary when the SEC and the banking regulators are requiring disclosures on, on books. So right now, as the regulators are requiring financial disclosure, it's hitting the balance sheets. Thank you for that. So as we see, there is money coming into the carbon market. So the next question is, how can communities and governments access this capital? So one of the ways that we've been able to, to do that is we provide fair and equitable pricing structures. So for example, there is a trading mechanism now, it's called NGO. If you look at the nature-based pricing of NGO, it's running at maybe $7.42. Last week, we were making trades selling that same offset at $12 to $15. So there are financial institutions who are cutting the actual market price of carbon in half. We were just talking to a country in Latin America this morning who is sponsoring with the World Bank and these Wall Street institutions, and they think that they're getting a really good deal at half of that price of $7. We, as carbon market exchange, are paying countries anywhere from $10 to $12 straight across uh, the board. So what is happening is uh, the creation of an artificial market that is not based. The regulatory system is creating a market that is not representative of the, of the market price. And Ralph, how would you say that we can improve this mechanism to make sure that countries and communities are actually receiving fair value for their carbon? was saying that the regulatory structure right now, which is generally created by the larger banks and the more powerful institutions, are artificially keeping prices down uh, so that they can profit on this spread. Uh, we can allow market forces to dictate a little bit more what's going on, which will be more money will go directly to communities, not into the coffers of the large institutions, the Blackstones, the Black Rocks, et cetera are out there right now uh, doing things, as well as we run into a lot of the energy producers in the field who are buying credits, or trying to buy credits from the local communities for three and four dollars a ton, where the market value of that stuff is 10, 12, 15 dollars. So there is a definite uh, pressure right now to keep the prices down 
but if prices are, uh, if, if the communities do get fair value for their, for not doing what they could do, which is develop their, their lands and resources, then more money will get into these communities so that they can provide health care with fresh water and medical and the, and the like, whatever they need. Uh, right now, there is very strong pressure to keep those prices low. It will eventually change, and market, uh, part of marketing is going to companies change it, because we go in and we outbid them, but they're bidding us to a bid twice that uh, on any given project in order to give a fair and equitable price to their local communities. That's, uh, that's great, Ralph. Thank you for that. And also, the United Nations is asking how countries can actually provide climate mitigation and climate adaptation. Who is going to pay for this? So with a fair and equitable carbon offset market, countries actually have the resources needed. So you have the polluters that are coming from developed nations that are now having to pay fair and equitable pricing to developed nations. So these country, the countries will actually have their own resources to cover predominantly all of the adaptation and mitigation in-house. We also have uh, Rose Pesova, who is here with us. She is our uh, Chief Director of Strategy. And Rose, I have a question for you. So how do you, your background is in uh, corporate America. How do you, or in corporate global world, yes, thank you. And how do you see corporations being able, what are the incentives for them to go the extra mile versus trying to take something uh, without fair pricing? Well, Europe is leading the way. Um, I'm so proud of Europe for being the first that is uh, forcing large corporations to comply with global standards established by the United Nations. The European Green Deal has allocated over a trillion dollars in order to um, bring about greater conservation and, and greater uh, carbon net zero emission. We have large corporations that have made promises out into the public and in, as publicly traded companies, Frankfurt Exchange has absolutely regulated what these publicly traded companies on the Frankfurt Exchange have to do in order to meet the requirements that they've established for net zero. So as Ralph just mentioned, in the United States, the Securities and Exchange Commission has now made a requirement that U.S.-based companies that are publicly traded have to report their carbon emission, have to report their carbon footprint. This is a lot of pressure on corporations. This is what keeps CEOs up at night. This is what makes board of directors make changes. This is how we push corporate world to make the necessary changes in their supply chain, in their sourcing, in their emissions, and if carbon credit pricing goes up, as she may describe, where it's fair and equitable to the countries that are originating these credits, it makes the playing field fair and equitable for these companies, and it puts pressure on these companies to make the changes they need to make in order to make the impact that they need to make to improve our planet. Thank you, Rose, for that, and uh, that's a great point as well. So we deal a lot with greenwashing. And in the United States and in Europe, we're actually seeing countries being prosecuted now, CEOs being put in handcuffs, Volkswagen, et cetera, uh, companies that are not Deutsche Bank, uh, that are saying that they're meeting these net zero goals and they are not. And so now we do have leverage to say, yes, if you want to be net zero, then you're going to have to meet it. Another, and pay for it, uh, threat, right? And as we know, everyone would like something for nothing. And uh, we have seen the detriment that island nations, we're seeing drought, we're seeing uh, crops uh, destroyed, uh, flooding, etc. And the communities on ground, are really the most effective. And so uh, going back to you, uh, Ralph, as well, how do you see this uh, distribution model between uh, communities and governments, and how can we assure that the communities are actually
actually receiving the funding as promised and it's not going into, let's say, the abyss of a general fund. Thank you for that. And just a little bit about what uh, Rose was saying as well. The SEC rules are very specific. If a company actually makes a public announcement that it's going to do something and it doesn't, they can be fined. Okay, so it is something that's not, well, we just said we were going to do it. If they don't do it, not only do they subject themselves to shareholder suits, but they can be fined by the SEC, and we're seeing the SEC step into this role. From a point of view of making sure the money, part of the problem that we see in the field is large companies, a lot of them are energy companies, trying to buy things cheap, and they're, uh, they're incentivizing government officials, i.e. bribing them, and what's happening is they get those rights at very low prices. We are coming into these, these uh, situations and we do not uh, act in that way, but we pay a fair price. The government does participate in that price at the, at the national level, but we also hold the money back and make sure that it goes into the local communities. Usually we establish a board at the community level that's run by the various community members. They're basically like an elected uh, officials, they're trustees to oversee how that money uh, gets distributed. We distribute the money directly to them, not through the federal government of this in the countries we're working with because those governments have a tendency to walk away with the money. We try to make sure that that money gets to where it is supposed to go and we hold it back. Also, the dollar amounts we're talking about are large. In one country in Latin America, we represent, our market chain represents 8% of that country's GDP. We are a large percentage of their overall economy. As a result, that cash flow is necessary for them to grow and maintain what they're doing. And making sure that the money doesn't, we just don't dump $100 million into the government offer which then disappears, and we make sure that that money gets to the communities, the communities have a say in how it's spent, and that money goes to where it's supposed to go, not just into the general fund. Thank you, Ralph, for that. Uh, that's, a, that's a great example, and exactly, the way that we make sure that the money is going is we have a board of directors with local NGOs and CBOs that we make sure that the money is actually going to where it's needed. And as you were saying, in one country in Latin America, we're providing almost 10% to the country's GDP. Carbon offsets can actually change the global economic structure, the global finance. We're talking of, about hundreds of millions of dollars that can come into countries to help support the needed infrastructure in addition to providing education, health care, sanitation, roads, economic opportunities, microfinance projects. This is really a solution-based model that can have a global effect on the economy. And with that, uh, Rose, we'd like to talk about, so now that we're talking about the corporate infrastructure, how can individuals participate? As we see, individuals want to make a difference. They want to be able to, to help the affected communities in climate change as well. In the past, carbon market or carbon credits were purchased by corporations in a wholesale model, which means they went to their markets, they bought them cheap, they bought a whole bunch of them, and that's called the you know, wholesale model. We decided that we wanted to bring the individuals, individuals to a retail model. So carbon credit, carbon market exchange is making carbon credits available on the retail level, which means people, if they're interested, whoever is interested in a particular project, we have our projects will be in NFT form. That's one of the reasons we're here at the Digital Innovation and Digital Art for Climate uh, booth. We, our projects, our, our projects in South America, Africa, Asia, wherever we go, we make these projects into a digital platform on the blockchain which provide retail opportunity for your friends, your family, your ecosystem 
to purchase parts of that project. That's a tangible digital asset utilization, which means the project is a tangible asset. Our coin, XCO2, provides you the mechanism to participate in the conservation projects that we have originated. So not only are we the largest originator of carbon projects in those three continents, we've also provided a mechanism for the retail model for you, your friends, your ecosystem to participate in that. So this is not just a corporate strategy anymore. This becomes a solution for everybody to participate in climate change. Thank you so much for that, Rose. And exactly, uh, according to Forbes, carbon offsets increased by 400% last year. By 2030, carbon offsets are projected to increase by 3,000%. Not only can corporations buy and, buy and create the speculative market, as you said, we have this retail market. The blockchain technology that we have is actually offset by 1,000%. Every transaction that is traded across chain, we all set in addition to every gas fee that is burned. So going back to some of our projects and issues that we've seen within this market. For example, uh, there is one large NGO who, who has bought uh, several thousand hectares of land. And what they were doing is that they would get carbon offsets from the land for the first 10 years. After they received the money from those offsets, they started logging the project, uh, right, which is on the verge of fraud. It's definitely within the gray area. And it's time that we as a collective address this and call this out and bring it to the forefront of what's happening. We're also seeing the timber industry jumping into the carbon market. We're doing tree planting. It takes 20 years for that tree to reach maturity. In between that time, they are actually being paid in carbon offsets for 20 years and then clear cutting that land. I'm not a mathematician, but I'm pretty sure that those offsets uh, are canceled at the, at the end of that time. There needs to be transparency in this market, not only in the finance, but also within the project. Who's getting paid, where is the money going, and how is it being distributed? Ralph, I'd like to ask you to talk on uh, some of the projects uh, that you see that have been the most beneficial and how that can continue to meet the demands that are being established here at Pop. I'd like to address one of the things that she brought up as well, which is within the carbon offset industry and within the, uh, there, are, there are large companies, one of which is a major sponsor here, they're a top, top of the list sponsor here, which is buying projects in, that are what they call managed or managed parks, which is they, they clear cut, they replant, or, but at the end of the day, they clear cut. If you clear cut a forest, it doesn't really grow back. It takes close to a thousand years for it to establish itself. We do not have the technology to replant on an effective basis. Ninety some odd percent of the, of the seedlings that they put in will die. Okay? There's a very famous uh, researcher in uh, British Columbia who's been studying forests for 40 years. Our research has shown that when you clear cut, even worse, they monocrop and they spray Roundup. So you're killing the soil and killing the biome that allows trees to grow. Uh, so that is a problem. In out the project that, if you take that and you compare it to one of our projects, which is the Mayan Forest Corridor, and if you have CNN in your hotel room, they did an uh, expose on that this morning, uh, and Dr. Alma K. will be with it. Uh, was talking about that. That project was done in perpetuity. In other words, we're preserving ancient forests and mother trees. Those are the trees that allow the forests to grow and to create that biodiversity. Now, that biodiversity is something that people don't talk about a lot. But remember, forests, plants, is where we get our medicines from. Most of our pharmaceutical products derive from nature before they were synthesized. So by destroying those 
uh, forest, what you're also destroying is the possibility maybe you kill the cure for cancer. I don't know. So in the projects that we're seeing, and it's a large tech company, and all they want to do is buy carbon offsets, very specific request, and they want managed forestry, which is, by definition, they clean up the forest, they clear cut them, and then try to regrow them, may or may not happen. In our projects, we, we do them in perpetuity. We have mul multiple projects where we're protecting large, historic, tropical forests. Some of those trees are a thousand years old or older. We don't really know. They're huge. They are uh, sequestering carbon. They are providing biodiversity. They're providing a habitat for, we see around here, we'll see pictures of jaguars and other large cats. Our corridor in, the, in Central America is the only known, uh, last known natural habitat for eight species of endangered cats. So you're providing that habitat for them. And right now, a lot of the trees on this planet are being clear cut for something the environmentalists support, which is biomass electricity. And I ask you, what is biomass? And everybody, well, it's garbage, it's this and that. What happens when you run out of that? What do you do? Oh, you clear cut a forest and you burn trees. A, a biomass electric plant has 12 times the carbon footprint as coal and 23 times the carbon footprint in natural gas. It is not a solution. Quite frankly, coal is biomass. It is very old biomass. So when they clear cut these forests for that, it is devastating the overall ecosystem. 8% of this planet was clear cut in 2020 for biomass electricity. So it is not a renewable water resource. They will not grow back at the rate that they expect. And they're clear cutting forests for electricity. It is not a solution. And it will not work. So there's a lot of No, thank you for that. Uh, so as we continue to wrap up on this climate finance, money does grow on trees. As you can see, Climate Market Exchange is here to bring truth and transparency to a market that is definitely uh, fraud, uh, or at least been accused of several uh, fraudulent scenarios. We actually provide consultancy to governments, to countries, to communities, to make sure that these individuals, these communities, these countries are receiving fair and equitable pricing for a very valuable resource. In addition, as uh, Ralph was saying, we have Wall Street joining in, we have the SEC who's joining in, we have the European Union. Who is creating these mandates? Corporations need them. There is no way around it. Otherwise, it's greenwashing the cases that we will continue to see. And in the closing, Rose, if you have any closing remarks, and then we'll pass it to Ralph and open it up for Q&A. Part of our strategy, in addition to the natural, um, the nature-based carbon credits, is also to be able to generate renewable project, viable renewable project credits as well. We want to accelerate project finance. We want to have project finance become a part of the solution. Project finance takes way too long. It's too hard to finance a solar project. It's too hard to finance various other projects because the financial industry has not streamlined project finance. Carbon Market Exchange is working with some very important project finance people in order to make project finance faster and deployment of good projects, not biomass, good projects and projects that help communities establish faster. So um, that's coming up. Thank you guys so much for being here. Appreciate everybody's attention. That's a great reminder, Rose. Uh, as you were saying, 15% uh, percent of the pricing that we pay actually goes into future projects. We realize that communities on ground are facing adaptation and mitigation issues. This is a direct source of finance that can go to build these local communities. Uh, Ralph, would you like to add anything for our closing? In closing, to reiterate what Shannon said, 15% of the money we generate goes to future project development so that there are renewables and other forms 
of energy that could provide solutions that we need in the future. From a finance point of view, this is a source of capital that can be deployed to make actual impact on the environment and Wall Street is buying in, the regulators are putting pressure, companies are feeling the pressure, and that will continue over time. Thank you all for your attention and being here with us today. Uh, we are Carbon Market Exchange. We are utilizing digital innovation. We would like to thank uh, Miro and our associates, partners, and co-hosts here. As XCO2 actually has created this retail market for transferability, transparency, validation, and verification of a market that uh, then we can definitely see some improvements. So thank you, Miro, for assisting us. Thank you very much, Sheena, thank you very much, Alex, and very much, Rose, for being here with us. Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's uh, very important to talk about uh, these new spaces, uh, new business models for public uh, sector finance or so. It's really a very valuable the approach you have, uh, speaking with governments, speaking with local communities, developing projects together in a very holistic way, which values the value of uh, ecosystems, uh, original uh, ecosystems, which have biodiversity preservation roles, and so many other additional roles, and not looking at the forest only as uh, biomass, but really as uh, eco-services uh, providers. And uh, as it's such an important topic, perhaps if there are any questions, uh, that would be... Uh, Thank you. Um, thanks, you. thanks for the presentation. Uh, I'm Peter Marshall, I'm coming from France, and I'm working in a forest cover company. Um, I've got uh, two questions. It's um, about the calculation of the carbon footprint. Do you have your own method to uh, calculate, or do you have another method? And uh, my second question is um, you talked about uh, blockchain and the NFT, but I saw that you have also tokens. And I would like to know um, how do you use it and what does it bring to you? Thank you uh, for that question and uh, thank you for your attendance. Uh, so the first question you were asking, what type of calculations are we basing? We, we actually have a model uh, that is using uh, current standards based on uh, airlines, Corsia, uh, things of that nature, to calculate one's emissions for flights. Same thing, we base a very basic model on miles per gallon in relation to emissions if you're driving a car. As far as the validation and verification of our projects, we use ISO 14000 standard, which is usually either through Gold, Vera, we're also looking at uh, Sierra Carbona for various uh, registries that we're utilizing. We, we realize that there is a huge gap in the emissions as far as scale. Uh, depending on the calculations, you could say that maybe you're emitting 3,000, when in reality it may be 3 million. Uh, so we do understand that there, there needs to be one model. I'm not sure that we as a collective have found it yet. Uh, that's why we always offset our carbon a thousand times uh, to make sure that we are covered as a collective. As you were saying, we also have a token. So our token is called XCO2. We are currently in a pre-sale phase. Uh, we are on Ethereum chain. Because of the emissions, though, we are moving uh, to Polygon. So both our NFT and our XCO2 will be on Polygon chain, just because the amount of emissions per transaction. XCO2, you can actually buy, hold, or retire. So the coin itself is you're buying into a pool of carbon offsets. Our NFT is the catalog. So once you can buy the NFT through the token. So once you go to the NFT, you can see a catalog of projects. There's serial numbers attached directly to the registry. 
From there, once you retire the offset, we'll provide you with a digital certificate, and that's the NFT. So you can choose to, maybe you want to support a project in the DRC, or you want to protect uh, orangutans in Indonesia, or South America, or you want to drain the equator in Africa. So we're allowing individuals to have the power of choice. Your money does matter, and it does affect. We as the collective can't make a, a collective contribution to fight climate change. decisions with uh, how we invest uh, our money and who we partner with and it's good to have you here to have this uh, solution discussed and uh, also that we all together learn and improve even our solutions that we have a systemic impact all together. Thanks for being with us and I hope uh, to continue our partnership towards COP28 and uh, all the other opportunities uh, to share uh, your solution, but in general also the idea that with new digital innovation combined with social innovation combined with uh, the global public sector innovation, that that's the formula for success in the fight against the climate crisis. Thank you very much.